What did you eat for breakfast? Oh, I didn't eat any breakfast. I don't eat breakfast, so I had coffee. That's what I had for breakfast. Welcome to Music on Your Own Terms, the podcast that aims to help musicians develop an entrepreneurial mindset through interviews, as well as discussing resources, concepts, successes, and more. Providing a platform to talk about negative emotions such as anxiety and depression in order to help overcome them in the context of music and reduce the social stigma. This is episode 146. This episode is sponsored by Ignite Your Music Career. You may remember in episode 90, I chatted to Craig Dodge about sync licensing and how he makes a living through writing music for TV, video games, and film. Musicians all over the world subscribe to Ignite Your Music Career and earn more royalties, more upfront sync fees, and more recurring revenue from their music. Whether you're a composer, singer-songwriter, band, beatmaker, or instrumentalist, your music can be earning you more money. Internationally acclaimed composer, musician, and music educator Craig Dodge has licensed his music in more than 1,000 TV show episodes, films, video games, and ads all over the world, and he will show you how you can too. Ignite gives you the information you need in a simple, accessible format, and you learn at your own pace. For just $6 a month, you get a video lesson each week on topics related to music licensing, from writing techniques to how to find your markets, and everything in between. You also get tools and activities to build the skills you need to be successful, and each lesson includes a royalty-free sound pack to download and use in your own music. The key to success in the music business today is to diversify your sources of revenue. Ignite will show you how. For more information or to subscribe to Ignite, visit the website at taris-studios.com or click the link on musiconyourownterms.com. Kate Shutt exemplifies everything this podcast is about a professional singer and musician, a guitar player with some sweet gear and awesome chops, a life coach that concentrates on mindset and mental health, all wrapped up with an attitude of continuous improvement and one that adapts to constant change. Kate shares her journey of switching from pursuing a literary degree at Harvard to studying at Berkeley and back again, then diving headlong into a music career that has seen her explore the jazz scenes in various cities around North America. We also hear about Kate's TEDx talk on the subject of how we can improve supporting others during times of grief, which draws upon the experience of caring for her late mother while she was going through her last years with terminal cancer. Finally, Kate talks about her latest album that was written during and after her mother had passed, both exploring emotions from the experience as well as celebrating her mother's life. If you enjoy the podcast and want to show your support, I'd be really grateful if you would consider signing up for the mailing list to stay in the loop with everything going on with the show. Just head over to musiconyourownterms.com and click the link. While you're there, you can also visit the store and grab some merch, or just buy me a coffee and help out with the running costs of the show. Thanks for listening. Okay, welcome to another episode of the podcast. Today I'm hanging out with Kate Shutt, who is a guitarist vocalist from New York. How are you doing and welcome. I'm doing great. So glad to be here. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, let's dive in and find out what you're all about. For me, you kind of tick all the boxes for this podcast because you're a, you know, an independent artist. You're also a guitar player and I've been nerding out on your Instagram with your nice music man. And we'll, we'll, we'll do a, te- <laughs> we'll do a, uh, you know, a gear nerd out in a bit, Sure. but you're also TEDx speaker, life coach, and you, you, you know, I've been watching a couple of your videos on mindset and willpower, which I yeah. thought were really cool. So mm-hmm. you, you're kind of like everything this podcast is about, which is great. So I guess in your own words, you know, who are you? What does your music sound like? All that good stuff. Sure. Well, I'm so happy to be here. And thanks so much for having me. It's uh, Sunday morning here in New York and mm-hmm. fun, to, fun to spend time with you. My name is Kate Shutt. I'm a, as you said, a guitarist, singer, songwriter, vocalist, producer, live in currently live in New York, though I've lived lots of other places. Mm -hmm. And my music is pop jazz. It would be my Cole, my songwriting hero is Cole Porter. 
Okay. And I'm, I'm always trying to write songs that sound like a lost jazz standard. So if Ella Fitzgerald or Billie Holiday or Sarah Vaughan or those types of people were alive today, my songs would be the kind of songs they'd sing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. So I read on your bio that you were inspired at a young age by Tina Turner. Correct. And the last thing you'd pull out of a burning building would not be your guitar. It would be your printed program. <laughs> uh, for those of us old enough to remember printed programs that don't exist anymore. Your thing, yeah. I, I have a few of them, so. Yeah. Let's let's dig into that a little bit. Like, how, how did you get into guitar and, you know, from that Tina Turner, I, I guess you, you saw her live? Your, I did, yeah. Took, well, her, took you? Yeah, first I had the Private Dancer album on cassette tape. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just basically wore that thing out. And then she went on tour later that year. And actually, my aunt took me to see her play. And that's where I, you know, got the printed program. And it's, it's right downstairs in my apartment. I know exactly mm -hmm. where it is at all times. Yeah. And just from there, you know, I was just, I just listened to music all the time. I had two older brothers. I'm, I'm the youngest. So I was sort of listening to all the music they were listening to, plus some of my own. And, my parents, my father's side of the family was very musical and my parents were determined that one of us would play an instrument and I was the only mm -hmm. one left since I was the youngest. Mm -hmm. So I started, they started me on piano lessons when I was 11 and then very soon after that I picked up the guitar. So yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Did you start with acoustic and then yeah, gravitate I mean, to electric? Or? Yeah, I started on actually classical guitar because that's kind of what my school, I could rent that instrument from my school and... Mm. But then very soon after that, my mom found me a guitar teacher in town who was like a really a major bebop jazz guitarist, a guy named John Darty. I grew up in Wilmington, Delaware, essentially. I mean, I, I mm -hmm. actually lived in Pennsylvania, but I, I grew up, went to school and stuff in Wilmington. So, so I started studying with John. And then, yeah, soon after that, I got a, an electric guitar. And, and he was, because he came straight out of like the bebop, George Benson, Pat Martino mm -hmm. kind of school of playing and organ Hammond B3 organ trios playing, you know, he started me, he started teaching me all those kind of, I don't know, drop three, drop two voicings on the guitar, like from the beginning. Like I never learned like a, like a G chord and a C chord and a D chord, like the kind of way you start. So I had to go right. back and learn all that stuff. So that was kind of a, a funny wrinkle in my education because a lot of those open chords that, that, you know, most guitarists start with, I didn't, but that was just because of the fact that I studied with this like jazzer from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And then you went on to do, I uh, went to Berkeley to study jazz performance as well. So I was just trolling your LinkedIn. You, you went mm -hmm. to Harvard correct? and you, you have a BA in English lit and language, and mm -hmm. it looks like the timelines cover, kind of overlap a little bit. So were correct. you studying online at Berkeley and doing their online course or no, like, how did that the work? The internet out? didn't really exist then. No, I went to Harvard. I was a major athlete in my life. So I played women's ice hockey and women's lacrosse and mm -hmm. went to Harvard, got recruited for playing sports and obviously academically could hang. So went to Harvard, played two, you know, was there for two years studying and playing both of those sports at the division one level. And then kind of had this epiphany, like, whoa, all my life, like I'd always done sports and music simultaneously. But then once you take it to that level, I mean, it's basically a full-time job. Like it, you're, you're studying all the time to, to maintain your grade level. And then you're playing sports, you know, five or six hours a day. And traveling on all the weekends and stuff like that. And I, I just kind of realized like, well, I'm not, I'm never going to become a coach. And at mm. the time the Olympics weren't available in either, in either of those sports to women. Of course, now there is mm -hmm. women's ice hockey is an Olympic sport. So that wasn't an option. And even so, you know, we all know how that goes for female athletes. There's no professional mm. leagues. So I was like, you know, I love sports. And of course it's a huge part of my identity, but like, I love music too. So let me let me let me put pause let me push pause on this for a little bit and so essentially i tried i asked harvard if i could go but simultaneously both places and they were n like no we don't do that um mm. actually nowadays they do you can do a dual degree with harvard and berkeley but at the time 25 years ago you could not so so i dropped out and went over to berkeley college of music and studied there for about eight six six to eight semesters in a row kind of just going mm -hmm. all year round and then i kind of got burned out from that and then went back to harvard and finished my 
degree there and finished playing sports okay. there. So it was, it was sort of a long, long winding road. Right. Any notable teachers at Berkeley? Oh, for sure. Because they, they, they come, they, they kind of have their own celebrity at this point. Mm -hmm. Some, a lot of them. Mm -hmm. So anyone that really inspired you and like you picked up some amazing yeah. you know, information from them? For sure. The people that I studied with, well, guitar playing wise is Mick Goodrick. Okay. Yep. I studied with Mick kind of towards the back half of my time there. And that was amazing, of course. He's an incredible guitar player and an incredible thinker. I think his book's come up on the podcast before as well. Yeah, yeah it has. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I studied, I, I did took a lot of classes in the arranging department. And my main teacher there was Phil Wilson, great, amazing trombone player. Okay. And I pretty much took every class Phil taught. Because I, I didn't, uh, Berkeley for me, to me, it was like, I kind of treated it like, I found the teachers that were amazing at teaching mm. and you know obviously they were amazing players so you don't get to be a teacher there without being that too but and then i just took whatever they offered because to me it's sort of a trade school right you're learning a skill mm -hmm. and it's not so much about the piece of paper in fact i never graduated from berkeley but i've done like nine semesters is what my transcript says right it's more like find the people that are amazing and study and take everything they mm. teach and so that's why I ended up taking like all the arranging classes that it offers and all the ear training classes that Berkeley offers. And even though I didn't need them for my jazz performance degree. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's, there was a couple of other great theory teachers I studied with there, a guy named Steve Dale. He's very old school. I'm not sure he's even there anymore, but yeah, I mean, Berkeley's a complicated place and it was certainly very different then than it was, than it is now. I mean, I was one of 200 women in the school. I was the only woman in the guitar department. Mm -hmm. It's a very different place now. For sure. Any notable famous people that were in your guitar group that, that came out at that time? Not that I know of, though I could, you know, they could be famous and I don't know it. Right. You know, I was there basically from 95 to 97 and then from basically 99 to the early, I don't know, 2001, 2002 taking classes in the summertime because it was cheaper and right. you, you didn't have to take a full course load, which is insanity at Berkeley. A full course load is, is like 16 credits of 16. Like that's basically 16 classes and it's, it's, it's crazy. So mm. once I, once I graduated from Harvard and I could kind of relax and like go at a slower pace. And I was also at that point touring and making records and writing songs. So I didn't, I couldn't go to school full time. Right. Cause I was doing all the other stuff. So yeah. Awesome. And I think a lot of times people drop out of Berkeley because they find, you know, the the uh, quote unquote success in what they want to do in the first place. So they don't really need this. St I mean, yeah. they can go for their own personal development. But, of course. Yeah. you know, at that point, it's like, oh, well, this is what I want to do anyway. So I'm just going to drop out for now and right. maybe deal with it later. So. Right. And then so you just mentioned you you weren't going to become a sports coach, but you are. You've been a life coach for uh, plot 10 plus years. Mm -hmm. So talk about incandescent coaching. Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I think the way that I talk about it is I, I help athletes, artists, and entrepreneurs make major change in their life. Mm. The through line through of my clients and what they're working on and going through and accomplishing and wanting to create in the world is change of some variety. And that, like I said, could be, you know, a college athlete who feels like, wow, you know, I, I used to be playing this certain way and now something's going on and I can't quite put my finger on it mm -hmm. to an Olympic athlete who is maybe transitioning from, you know, being that was their full-time job to like, oh, I'm, I've sort of aged out of this and now I've got mm -hmm. to figure out what's next for me to, you know, a, a mom who's getting into the working world again after taking care of her kids for the last 20 years to, you know, a C-level entrepreneur or founder of a business who, you know, maybe he's on, he or she is on her second business and is like, hmm, I don't know if this is like, I can do this, like, you know, but I don't know if I really want to do it anymore. Right. You know, I, that, that walking people through that journey of like, making change in their life is a real privilege and an honor. And mm. yeah, it's a, it's something I'm, I just love doing and I'm, you know, really, I take really seriously. And also, I mean, it's like, it's my, I've been doing it for myself, you know, like that's, I'm constantly making changes as, as we just talked about. Like I, 
I was at Harvard University and I decided to drop out, you know, like, mm -hmm. so I've always been a seeker and I've always put myself in relationship to people that were much wiser than me mm -hmm. to, to create what I want next. And that's what I do for my clients. That's fantastic. And I think, yeah, that's one of the uh, core kind of values of being an entrepreneur is, is just surrounding yourself with people that will make you better mm. rather than, you know, pulling you back mm -hmm. in a way. Totally. So I think, you know, all your experiences definitely sound like, you know, you, you not only have you had such a, a wide spectrum of experiences in school, and but you're also using that in your coaching business uh, and, and your music, I'm, I'm sure you're that side of the business is really helping your music career as well. So, you know, it does sound like you, you have this broad spectrum to draw on, which is, which is excellent. Yeah. So yeah, let's, I guess let's move on to the, the reason we're here is your, your album. And just, just before I, I came on here, I watched your Ted talk. So mm, thank you. I mean, that was very, very powerful. Thank you. And definitely got me thinking, you know, something I could do better. Mm. And so that's for, for listeners, that's called the casserole of grief. Uh, oh, sorry, a grief casserole, which I think I'm titling this episode because I think it's really poignant and yeah. a really good, good, you know, thing. But yeah, if you wouldn't mind just expanding on that and then we'll move on to the album. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're sort of the, the one and the same and it, mm. the, the, the TED talk, the TEDx talk came out of the album. So in 2010, I had. I had li I lived in Canada from about 2003 to 2010, mm -hmm. and I'm American, but I had moved up there with my partner at the time, and also to just I had that was I moved there from Boston, so I was looking for a change of locale, and so we moved up there, and I was you know majorly involved in the Canadian music scene and doing my own music up there, and really loved it. But in 2010, decided to make a move and came back to to the States and lived in, moved to New York mm -hmm. as a, you know, thought about moving a lot of other places, but moved to New York and was going along to kind of establishing myself and getting, you know, getting to know the music scene here in the city. And at about, so I moved in January and in October, my mom um, got diagnosed with a very rare and aggressive form of ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. And so I, 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 I mean, I say I decided to move home, but it really wasn't a decision. I just, that's what I was going to do. I just, right. she got the diagnosis and the next day I was moved into, you know, one of my brother's bedrooms in our, our, in our family house and living there with my parents and taking, starting the process of taking care of her. And, you know, we didn't know what, what was going to happen though. We knew once she had a debulking surgery and started frontline chemo that basically her doctor was like, you know, maybe she'll have one good year and probably a year after that she'll be dead. Mm -hmm. And so, okay. And so we started down that road and I was her primary caregiver. And I mean, I have a dad and he's amazing and great support, but he's sort of an old school dad and he couldn't be, uh, you know, the, the, the care, her care and managing her care was so overwhelming that I had, mm -hmm. to, you know, I had to do it. Um, so so yeah, so I didn't touch my guitar for a year and a half, but I kept notes about the kind of songs that I would want to write and ideas for songs that whole time. And so eventually she went into a remission and I got the chance through an artist residency program called the U-Cross Foundation to have some time apart and away and just really focus just on starting writing all those songs. Mm -hmm. So fast forward to, you know, my mom ended up living for four and a half years because I was able to really, you know, be there and be present and maximize her quality of life. Mm -hmm. And a little bit after that first year and a half, I would, you know, kind of periodically get times when she would go into remission or was feeling a lot better. I would get little chunks of time to go back to go, you know, to places and, and work on my songs. But really I started working on them, you know, in earnest once she died in 2015 and uh and then you know eventually had 17 songs and started looking for a producer i've produced all my own albums and other people's albums but i at this point knew i didn't want to produce this record i needed mm -hmm. i needed someone else wearing that hat so i found and uh the amazing rob mounsey and kevin killen and just an incredible cast of players here in new york and we made the bright nowhere record awesome 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, my first question is, you know, how, how important was the record in terms of your own, you know, healing from the process? Mm. I mean, you know, I get, I get that question asked a lot and I never conceived of it as like, I'm going to write this record and heal myself and feel better. Like mm. I'm just a songwriter. And the way I process the world is through song. To me, it never, it doesn't, it never occurred to me to think like this is a healing process. Now, of course, I, the, the process of writing a song is one of contemplation and solitude and for me and wrestling with and chewing on mm. ideas, you know? And so through that process, I got to, come to terms with a lot of things that were question marks for me during during the, her care mm -hmm. and about our relationship and about what it means to live in the land of illness um and what it means to have a life limiting or life you know like a like a diagnosis like her so obviously it helped a lot if you, if, you know, just to answer your question bluntly, like it, it helped in the healing process a lot, but for me, it was more about wrestling with and gnawing on some fundamental questions about mortality and what it means to be human. Mm. Um, and one thing that I, I did pick up on, on, in the TEDx talk was the fact that you'd written a song in that one of those breaks mm -hmm. and it kind of you you'd had the you, you you were saying that your mother was always questioning you know if she's a burden mm -hmm. and you wrote the song and played the song and then you never had that conversation again yes um i mean why why do you think it took the the lyrics and the song to get that message you know across yeah you know i think that why did it take her why did it take the song i think you know people are People are set in their ways and mm. they have a particular mindset, a particular way of looking at the world that can be very rigid, you know? And for my mom, it was such a, it was such a different position for her to be in. She was always the caregiver. She was always the mm. rock. She was always the, person who took care of everyone else and to be suddenly overnight basically thrust into the position of not that you know something like being fed you know something like a song like some powerful experience other than just a conversation needed to unlock her openness to receiving mm. Maybe that's the best way to put it, you know? So, yeah, let's talk a bit more about the TEDx talk. I mean, how did you come about coming up on that? Uh, but basically, the, the premise for listeners is that you, you, you're you you're trying to get across that we can do grief better, and, and which I completely agree. I'm definitely guilty of not being able to kind of know what as you said know what to say and 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 be there for people and mm -hmm. the whole concept of the grief casserole is just by someone i love your comment is you know i hate i hate you for dropping off a, a mac and cheese casserole said no one ever yeah i love that quote yeah but yeah i mean how how did you come about you know coming about that concept well it was my lived experience i mean when i hmm. got the when I got the offer to do the TED talk, I was invited to give it and it was with very little time, but before it happened and I wanted to do a talk about how, when I was taking care of her, I was left by most of my friends and acquaintances and family members outside of my immediate family, of course, but, but even in my immediate family to some degree, kind of, everybody tiptoes around you as the primary caregiver because they think you're busy or they don't want to get in the way or they want to don't want to, you know, make you feel worse than you already feel and that kind of thing. And for me, my experience, and I don't claim to say that this is everybody's experience when they're in a position like this, but 
for me that like that was not what I needed at that point. What I mm. needed was people to show up and say, not even how can I help you was for them to just show up and say, I know that you probably have to go take your mom to the chemo suite, you know, to get an infusion of chemo this week. Can we, can I, can I volunteer to drive her and do that with you or for you so that you don't have to go and sit there for six hours for once, you know, things like that. Or can I, can I just drop off dinner for Thursday night? So you don't have to think about it. Mm. And you know, no one does that. Like literally no one does that. They do it. They somewhat do it when the person that you're caring for dies, but then, but even then they only do it for like the first two weeks and then it's crickets. Right. <laughs> and you as the caregiver are, as I described it in the TEDx talk, you're in a vacuum. You're sort of left in this weird vacuum where people are like, oh, I don't want to disturb you. And when they see you, they're like, oh, I, I wish I knew what to do for you. But, you know, you know, I haven't been in touch because I didn't want to take up more of your time. And it's like hey, I'm an adult. Um, I'll tell you if you're taking up my time because actually I, I don't have a lot of it and I'll let you know, mm. you know? But like, don't leave me in this weird vacuum. For sure. And I, But I, I mean, I think a lot of times though, somebody going through that experience could end up getting, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, like a chip on their shoulder or being very, they could end up with resentment you know, mm. towards other people doing that. But mm -hmm. it does sound like your experience has created more of an empathy of how difficult it is on the other person's end. And that's, you know, mm. I don't know if that's, that's why you've kind of shared this, I guess, strat you know, the, at the end, you, you talk about three strategies of how to, how to help. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe the empathy, like, it, I feel that there's a lot of empathy missing from society today. That's my take. And I mm -hmm. think the, be, it, it takes someone more prolific to kind of figure out why people are doing what they're doing mm. rather than just being like, well, you did this and now I'm, I'm pissed off. Right. You know what I mean? I think my, the reason why I didn't get upset, I mean, of course I got upset at some, sometimes, mm. but the reason why I had empathy is because I had been that person, you know, like, it is difficult to know what to say to mm. someone whose whole life, you know, has changed overnight. Not only mine, but my mom's, you know, and who is at a crisis point in their life where the landscape all of a sudden looks so different. And I'm not, it doesn't even have to be a death, right? I mean, the pandemic mm. showed us how hard things can be. I mean, you could have just lost your job. You could have had been forced to homeschool your kids at the same time that you do your job from home. I mean, there's so many loss is such a broad topic. So I think I, I had empathy because I have been that person that cares so much for someone, but doesn't know how to show up. And I fundamentally think people, humans do want to do the right thing. They just like need a script mm -hmm. or maybe not even a script, just like the two, the first two lines of a script to get started. Right. It's, it's the getting started. That's hard. You know, it's the, it's the, what do I say to someone who just lost their mom? Well, here's a couple things you can say, you know, and there's, and, and don't, and say, you know, and say these things and don't expect a response. Like, don't make it about you. That's the problem mm -hmm. is that people make it about them when really their impulse is great. It's about the other person, but then somehow they get in the way. Mm -hmm. And think like, oh, I, I'm not going to say the right thing or, oh, I'm imposing or I said that thing and I'm expecting a, re a response. And it's like, well, that that person going through that experience can't respond to you right now. Like, right. you know, and so that's where that tip of like, send them an email or a text or a phone call. Don't sit on the fence deciding which one to do. Pick one and do it. <laughs> and then just say, I'm thinking, be honest. Like, I don't have any clue what you're going through because you don't, you know. A friend of mine just lost his mother. Like, okay, I have the experience of losing my mother too, but I'm not him. I'm not a man. Right. You know, I didn't, I didn't work with my mom like he did, et cetera. So it's like, I just called him and said, I'm so sorry. I don't have any clue what you're going through. You know, I know how close you two were and I'm feeling for you guys and I'm feeling for you because it's such a strange world to be in without a mom, especially if you're so lucky as to have one into adulthood. And a great one at that, you know, like a loving, mm -hmm. caring, present one. And 
I love you. I'm thinking of you. No need to respond, you know, and that's it. Like there, there you go. Like how hard was that? You know, Absolutely. but no one, but no one teaches this stuff in the, in the Western culture. No one, you know, death is such a taboo mm-hmm. topic and it, and it still is. I mean, we, and we've come a long way in the last decade. I mean, when my mom was sick, there wasn't such things as death over dinner or huge conferences about, you know, ending life well, like the end well conference or the dinner party, which is another sort of new thing that sprung up to help people going through grief. Like now there's the the wave has built and is crested Mm -hmm. and we're, we're now starting to have these conversations societally about what is a good death and what does it mean and how to end up, you know, not dying in a hospital connected to a bunch of machines, unless that's how you want to go. So, you know, there is definitely more awareness about how to have the quality of life that you desire at the end and what that means. And and it's time and the space to think about it, but you know, we're still like hundreds of years away from a society that can really deal Mm -hmm. with mortality. For sure. Thank you so much. Mm. So yeah, let's let's do our gear deep dive. Sure. I mean, <laughs> let's 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 start with the album because obviously I want to spend a little more time with the album. Sure. What kind of equipment? You know how how did you come about figuring out like sounds and 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 amps and all that good stuff? Mm, yeah. Well, I as I said, I hired Rob Mounsey to produce the record, and so Rob and I spent a lot of time a lot of time together before we started recording, just conceiving of the sound of the record. I mean, I knew that I didn't want it to be solo guitar and voice, which was a lot of what people were saying to me who had heard this music. And I had been gigging some of this music around in various combinations of ensembles. So solo guitar and voice, guitar, bass, duo, guitar, guitar, duo, trio configurations and stuff like that. So I knew that it was going to be a bigger sounding album than that and you know rob rob is an uh, amazing i think he's he's a musician's musician and Mm -hmm. just an incredible producer and arranger and musical mind and listener and empathetic heart-filled genius (laughs) and so you know he and i had a lot of conversations about what we wanted to, to sound like or what i wanted to sound like and how he could help me get that vision and I had a lot of reference points. I mean, some of the Paul Simon Graceland slash Rhythm of the Saints records, Mm -hmm. those two records sonically, especially the Rhythm of the Saints record, you know, there were, there were touchstones that we listened to together and talked about. And I knew I would have background vocalists and I don't do any of my own background vocalists because I'm not that enamored with my voice. So, you know, we talked a lot about that and who that, who that was going to be and what particular combination and, so it was a lot of just sitting with the songs and Rob is the most tasteful. He's like me, sort of less is more restraint taste. Mm-hmm. So it was a lot of just, you know, sitting there and talking it out. And then obviously we went into do bass bed tracks and I compose and perform a lot on still on a classical guitar, actually. So that's my, the nylon string playing you hear is all me. Mm -hmm. And so we knew that would sort of go well with his keyboard playing. And then we hired Richard Hammond, who's just a fantastic electric and upright player, because we knew we would want both. So we, we hired him. And Chris Parker is just, I mean, there's just, he's one of the greatest living drummers who can do it all. So, um, you know, with from there we sort of then it was just dreaming of like, well, who's who's gonna be, you know, who's gonna play the percussion? And obviously Rob has his finger on the pulse of everybody in New York. Mm-hmm. So it was it was really just a it was like a smorgasbord of like, really, we can get that guy? Okay, let's do it. You know, we can get that we can get that b- background vocalist group. Okay, let's do it. So it was amazing. That's great. Was there anything that surprised you from an equipment standpoint that like, I don't know if he did any tricks that you wouldn't Mm. have thought of or, you know, any, any weird like household object that got used for a specific sound or anything like that? Yeah. Well, immediately what comes to mind is working with Kevin Killen as the engineer. I mean, you know, one of the greatest 
uh, engineers to have ever lived. Ke Kevin is so amazing. It's he, He's just on another planet in terms of he really, because of how he learned the trade, his, you know, before any of this trickery, <laughs> um, he is so transparent. Like there's, there's just minimal, he gets the sound with a microphone. Uh -huh. That's it. Period. The end, basically. Like, and that was just amazing to me because, you know, I'm, I, I sort of grew up, there was enough digital technology around and, uh, and the engineers that I've worked with before and slash engineering my own stuff, you know, the, the tendency is to put something on when you can, like push the button if you can. Uh -huh. And Kevin is not that way at all. And that was real, a real eye opener to me and just so beautiful. I mean, he's like, what would the analogy be? He's like, you know, the, the, the us in a room together is like, he's playing like solo violin or something like that. I mean, he's like, he's, he doesn't need anything else. It's like, we are the acoustic instruments and he's just capturing it with the most, with the, well, the least amount of equipment needed. basically. Mm -hmm. So that, that's one. I, I feel the same way about Jay Newland who in, uh, mixed the record too. I mean, Jay's ability to really bring out what, which by the, by the time we got to the end of recording, there was, there were some really big tracks and really nuanced. And I mean, obviously that's the job of a mix engineer, but Jay just, Jay just really got it in a way that I felt no other mix engineer really has gotten anything because I don't mix my own records. Mm -hmm. So I was completely floored by Jay's ears and, and heart and thoughtfulness. And then in terms of like, are there, were there specific, you know, things yeah, Roger Squatero, the uh, percussionist, used this. I mean, percussionists come with, you know, boxes box, and boxes right. and boxes of interesting things. And he used a, a really cool kid's toy that was like this very strange sort of apple, like oversized apple that had some sort of music box thing in it, but, but that only worked like when you moved it. Mm. And it's in the, you can hear it in the beginning and the ending, especially the ending of Bright Nowhere, of the song Bright Nowhere. So that was sort of a fun thing. I mean, just being being at the percussion tracking sessions, you know, it's just like a wonderland of like weirdo stuff being <laughs> being used. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. You know, I mean, Rob, Rob's keyboard playing was amazing. And you know, there's just some incredible tracks in there. One, one track, we, the song Bright Nowhere, we went back and forth a lot about how he does a keyboard solo in that song and like what that sound should be. Mm -hmm. And we sort of ended up on an interesting sound that I, that I really felt strongly about, but it, you know, he, he, he sort of he did the solo in a number of ways that maybe were more stylistically appropriate, but I wanted something a little edgier and, you know, anyway, something, something different. And, and the track mothers is like that too. It's like mothers is this beautiful tribute. Mm -hmm. And, and then if you listen to the solo, it's, you know, the, the choice of the choice of the uh, sound of the instrument is, is, probably not what most people would do but i think it fits the topic and the what i what i was trying to get at as a songwriter that like mothers are so complicated uh, they're such complicated people sure so yeah awesome yeah and let's just talk about your guitar setup sure M music man what's the model on that one that uh it's a silhouette it's a music man silhouette gold roller um that's what I use for my electric guitar. And I'm really playing that guitar because I was a Les Paul player all my life. You know, I'm a female, I'm female. So my, that scale length on a Les Paul is just a little more comfortable for me. Mm -hmm. I've tried playing Fender Telecasters and Stratocasters over the year and over the years. And it, the le neck length is a little too long for me. It just doesn't feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And so I've always gravitated back to my Les Paul, but I'm, you know, my Les Paul weighs 14 pounds and I say. yeah, I can't, just can't do it anymore. So my guitar teacher now, uh, amazing teacher and musician named Bruce Arnold, which everybody should go check out if they're looking for 
a teacher just get into something really amazing. He's an incredible teacher. He plays a Music Man silhouette. And he told me about the Gold Roller because I love humbuckers. And he was playing at NAMM, doing some stuff for Music Man and other things. And he played that guitar. They gave him that guitar to play. And he was just blown away by it. When I, So I see him for lessons. And he, he's like, I was complaining about my shoulder and the Les Paul. And, you know, practicing four to eight hours a day, sometimes longer, mm-hmm. that really takes a toll on your body. And he was like, you should check out the Gold Roller. And so I went on to Reverb.com and I've been watching a couple of them, you know, come up. And finally, I saw one come up that was used. It was like in a really low price point, like shockingly low. So I was like, bye, <laughs> you know, mm. and uh, I haven't looked back. It's awesome. I mean, people, people dig the goldness of it. It's pretty funny. That's awesome. What amp and effects are you going through? Right now I go through a 54 Fender Deluxe, mm-hmm. vintage 54 Deluxe, which is awesome. I mean, I love a champ. I have a 58 or 59 champ at my girlfriend's house and san diego and i'd love to have that here too so someday i'll get a champ for for this side of the country and then i i'm I'm really i like to keep things in based in my fingers Mm -hmm. so i basically i have i'm I'm looking down at my pedal board because it's just easier to look at i have a a ghost drive which is this drive by a guy jhv3 that's the that's the name of the guy who builds them okay it's just a, a very transparent boost with a you know, with a drive, a drive boost on it mm-hmm. as well. But I, I basically never kick that in. I just use the, the boost, you know, like the transparent boost. Sure. And then I use a reverb because obviously the deluxe doesn't have reverb. I did a major shoot out of those. And so I chose the spring theory by sub decay. Okay. Not heard um, of that which I really like. Yeah. It's a really, it's a really nice one. It only does only mimics a spring sound. So you have to like that. Mm. And then uh, I have a delay pedal, which is the Emma Electronic Navigator, which I love because it's like a two, it's two delays, you know, that you can set separately. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm obsessed with that delay. It's amazing. So that's it really in a tuner. That's, that's kind of currently. And then, I mean, if I'm want something more, I'm actually, I've been using the, the Universal Audio Oxbox for recording into Pro Tools and, and it is amazing. And just the sound, the sound possibilities in there are incredible. Do you find that to be limiting? I actually just bought a Torpedo Reload. Mm. And the reason I went with that one versus the... I was looking... Because everyone's like looking... There's a lot of Oxboxes on on YouTube. Mm. I mean, the reason I didn't go with that is because the limiting factor. You can't put your own IRs in it. Mm -hmm. It, It's very... I I heard a description as it's high quality audio engineers that really know what they're doing. And they just put the stuff you need into it. Mm -hmm. But... I like to tweak stuff. So yeah, yeah. The, the torpedo was like, it has this massive software of all these different cabinets. So wow. that's the one I went with. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, I mean, do you find it limiting or n- not really? No, I don't find it limiting because I'm usually, I'm just trying to recreate what I have, mm-hmm. you know, so it, in the box. So for me, it's, it's more than enough. I mean, I'm, but I'm not, I, again, like my dream is to plug directly into my, amp and play right. like i i don't want to for me my my way of thinking about music is like it's hard enough to like play a c scale musically mm-hmm. like and so you know i want to spend more time doing that than I do right want to want to spend tweaking the sounds so for sure that's just me that's just me right yeah i mean my my reasoning for getting it is because i i play metal more 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 than uh-huh. anything else yeah. and so yeah. that requires having a tube amp quite loud because it works better and right. i can't do that at 10 at night of course um <laughs> yeah and my issue with plugins was the latency so yeah, you know no matter like i need a, obviously a better system or, or a mm-hmm. interface with a dsp chip in it but right right now i mean having having the reload and being able to run my tube amp silently Mm -hmm. it's the immediacy of of my of what i hear in my headphones is just like a game changer now so i can like for sure go into my my daw and i'm I'm playing an amp sound i mean the plugins sound great but only after Mm -hmm. the fact so right that's that's you know that's what it is right now so yeah no and i think that the attenuating possibility of of the torpedo and of the oxbox is is amazing Mm. you know you can get the deluxe is a pretty loud amp, mm-hmm. right? And you don't, you can't get a breakup 
un- unless right. it's playing at a certain volume, which you just, I mean, I can't listen to that all day long. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not good for my ears. And obviously sure. that's not the sound I want. So all the time, but the ability to attenuate it and, and drive the amp that way is pretty amazing. Mm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, let's move on to the non quick fire question round. Yeah. Okay. I won't do my normal first one because it deals with negative connotations and stuff. And we've already kind sure. of covered that with, with your experience of your album and your mom. So let's uh-huh. stick with question two, which is what major positive experience have, has given you the push to follow this journey? Oh, great question. Well, it's just, it, for me, it always comes back to the music and to the artists that I love, you know? So for me, it's Tina Turner, you know, it's listening to that music. It's hearing the piano playing of Earl Garner. It's, you know, knowing, knowing about John Coltrane's journey as a player, you know, for me, it, it always comes back to the, to the people that when I hear that music and I just feel and I feel something and mm-hmm. I want to be able to do that myself. Awesome. What is one piece of advice that you would give a musician looking to make a living from music? Love the process. Find a way, if you already don't, if you don't, find a way to love the process, whether things are going well or not well, whether you're making money or not making money from it, whether you're, you know, plateauing or speeding ahead or feeling like you're going backwards. Like the only thing there is, is process. And if you don't love it just for that, you're going to have, you're going to suffer. Awesome. So that's one. I think I, can I add another one? Sure. Absolutely. Which is eyes on your own paper. Like Mm -hmm. comparison, comparison is the path to insanity and again, suffering. So Mm -hmm. just keep your eyes on your own paper. You know, awesome. everybody's their own person. They're on their own journey. No one's ahead of you. No one's behind you. you. You're all just where you are. Fantastic. What one resource, be that book, podcast, blog, would you recommend to artists looking to be successful? And I say successful air quotes because that's how you define it. Mm. Well, I have so many for different parts of their, their life and depending on where they are and their, what, they, what they're working on. I mean, if they're a songwriter, I have a couple. One is I wrote a songwriting book. It's not out yet. I'm working on self-publishing it, so they should get on my mailing list and uh, get it when it comes out because I think it's it's an amazing book, not only because I wrote it, but because what I tried to do was because I poured my heart and soul into it, basically. Songwriting wasn't always easy for me, mm. and it took me many years to figure out how to do it in a way that didn't make me want to slip my wrist. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so I really talk about it in a way that walks you through it step by step, but also gives you all the sort of life coaching part of it, too. Mm. And there isn't a book out there like that. So they should get your listeners should get on my mailing list, which is can, they can do at kateshut.com. So that's for songwriting. But also for songwriting, I would say, like, you know, you got to listen to music. You got to listen to great songs, whatever, however you define that. 80 percent of the time you just got to be listening to that stuff and then of course doing it so that's that uh what what would i what else would i offer as something to help them on their journey to success learn to play learn like to study with a drummer at some point study percussion or drums at some point because rhythm is the most fundamental mm-hmm. of music and it'll make you a better musician and it's fun Right. you know and and just that process of be, if you aren't already or if you haven't already becoming a beginner again is so great and what else would i say i mean i've already dropped a few names like my my teacher uh, my guitar teacher bruce arnold is an amazing resource in terms of if you want to study sort of you know jazz everything about jazz and and i i i also think having taken every single ear training class at berkeley and came out of there feeling like I still couldn't hear anything. Mm. Bruce went to Berkeley as well back in the day, like when everybody that we know and love went there, like, you know, Pat Metheny, et cetera, et cetera. And Bruce felt the same way. So he set about to create an ear training system that actually works. Mm-hmm. And so I've been doing that for years and it does because it's based on like how you actually hear while you're playing. 
So if you're if you're into that kind of thing and you want to study that and get better at what you're here, you know, being able to play what you hear and hear what you play, et cetera, et cetera. He's the guy, I think, out of all the systems out there. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I could go on. I mean, I think I could go on in a very life coachy way too. You know, trying to think what one resource would I offer in terms of like mindset and mental attitude. I mean, there's so many. Just this idea that you create, you know, this idea that you create your world. Mm -hmm. You know, the world isn't one way or the other. It's how you see it. It is, is how you experience it. For sure. So, you know, being aware of that and then working to understand how you can use that notion to create what you want in the world and create your experience of it. Fantastic. Yeah, totally agree. Last question is, what does music mean to you? Joy. Music means joy and mostly joy. And then the other thing I would say is like just music means the expression of all states of being human. You know, it's it's a conduit to our ability and ability and ability ability to express and abil ability to receive expressions of other sentient beings mm -hmm. all right awesome thank you so much yeah easy you. questions sure where can people find out all about you join your mailing list listen to your music sure well most everything is found at kateshut.com so that's k-a-t-e-s c-h-u-t-t dot com um you can sign up for my mailing list there uh it's totally awesome so you should get yourself on it i send it out every two weeks i don't you know it's not crazy amount of uh, emails from me but it's very cool very curated very about music discovery and discovery about other things besides music mm -hmm. so get on that sign up for the to be notified when the book comes out you can hear all my music there you can link to all my socials there and on the socials i'm just at kate shut and then if you want to find out more about coaching and perhaps start coaching with me, which would be amazing around anything. I mean, I, you know, I coach all kinds of people from all walks of life who are up to something in their lives. So you can get in touch with me through my Kate Shut website, or you can go to incandescentcoaching.com. And I'm not going to spell that, but it's spelled exactly how the word is spelled, mm -hmm. incandescentcoaching.com. And you can drop me a line. You can read more about how I coach, what I coach you know, what it's like, what it looks like to work with me financially and more, more importantly, energetically and like commitment wise, time wise. And yeah. And I look forward to, you know, helping people, helping your listeners make change and whatever that means for them. All right. Fantastic. So at the end, I like to play a, a piece of music by the, the artist I'm interviewing. And I believe you guys already sent me mothers. Is yes, that what you want correct. to play? So yeah, I mean, we, we, I think we already talked about it a little bit. Any any other sure. things you want to touch on about the track? Sure. Yeah, like I said, uh, I'm always trying to write a song that sounds like a lost standard. Mm -hmm. And I believe that Mothers fits into that category. Now, of course, I'm a woman writing in the 21st century, and I'm living my own life, so it's not going to sound exactly like a, a song that was you know, written in the 30s and the 40s by a white male or not a white male but you know what i mean by generally speaking a male so when i say like i'm trying to write a lost jazz standard it's it's i mean inflected through my own experience obviously mm -hmm. and i think mothers is one of those songs you know it's an aaba -A form it's it's a classic refrain song that that we hear you know throughout the the great american songbook a song with a refrain yeah, it's a it's a song I couldn't write until after my mom died. I it was practically one of the last songs I wrote for the record. Mm. But I'd had the idea for probably the whole time. So it probably took me from the time I wrote down the idea of it to the time it actually I finished a first a shitty first draft would have been probably 7 years. Mm. <laughs> so, but I'm a very uh, that's how I work as a songwriter. So, yeah, enjoy. I think it captures the mystery and the wonder and the, I don't know, 
yeah, the 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 beguilingness and the the bewildering quality of mothers, you know, how they're they can be this incredible nurturing presence and they're also so much we don't know about them and there's so much that society puts on them. Mm. That's what I was trying to get to. Fantastic. This has been an incredible conversation. I really, really appreciate you taking the time. I feel I feel like we could go for another hour, but we don't have the time. So. <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much. You know, continued success. Stay in touch. Thank you. Yeah, I will. You too. And and good luck to everybody out there. And, uh, you know, keep on playing and keep on listening. Thank you so much for listening. I'd really appreciate it if you would leave a review on iTunes or your favorite podcast platform as this really helps get the word out about the podcast so other musicians can benefit from the awesome knowledge that my guests are sharing. The more the musicians' community collectively learns, the stronger we will become. A rising tide lifts all ships. This episode is sponsored by the Skinny Armadillo Printing Company in Fort Worth, Texas, offering a full range of apparel decoration and promotional items, such as screen printing, embroidery, laser engraving, and much more. The Skinny Armadillo is now offering a merch fulfillment service including on-demand printing and a custom-built web store so you can concentrate on your music and running your business as a musician. Visit theskinnyarmadillo.com or call 817-546-1430 to learn how the Skinny Armadillo can help you take your merch to the next level. Keep pushing the needle and be excellent to each other. This is Kate Shutt with Mothers. Thank you. Mothers no pleasure and mothers no pain. Mothers are warm and mothers are vain. And some are still wild, hearing only the wind in their veins. But they're beautiful and tired so full of love mothers no longing mothers no fear mothers they wait and mothers they cheer and mothers have secrets we're never ready to hear Mothers make dread, mothers get lost, and mothers get dead, and mothers are in way over their heads. They're beautiful and tired, and so. Mothers make love and mothers make dread and Mothers get lost and mothers get dead And mothers are in way over their heads Mothers make love and mothers make dread and Mothers get lost and mothers get dead And mothers are in way, 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 way over